Okay, colleagues, greetings and welcome back. So, uh, uh, today, another follow-up from the discussion we've had in the seminars. So, specifically, I want to address the question of values, values, right? So, an immediate issue which comes up is that if we believe that the universe is just the schlund des zwecklosen chaos der materie, the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, right? Something like this formula. Um... What does that mean for morality, right? If life is simply a motion of limbs, if life is nothing but a motion of limbs, what meaning can our lives have? And, you know, what is the value of values, right? So Thomas Hobbes, again, the, the book I've pointed to right now, uh, uh, begins his philosophy by saying, this is a very important phrase, a very important phrase for me, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite, or desire. That is it which he, for his part, calleth good. And the object of his hate and aversion, men calleth evil. But there is nothing simply on, or simply and absolutely so. So nothing is simply and absolutely good or evil, right? It is our desires that make it so, right? So this is, this is a, a, a very important, very important programmatic statement uh, by again by an early naturalist philosopher um, Hobbes, right? Uh, uh, and and let me let me let me make this a bit more precise and let me situate this in a larger philosophical context. So this is known very famously as the is ought problem. It uh, you know in its contemporary formulation, I feel that people very often attributed to David Hume, sometimes again also known as Hume's guillotine. I hope I'm spelling this correctly. So, um, probably not. Uh, so the idea is that, again, you cannot derive value statements from normative statements, right? You cannot derive normative statements from prescriptive. I'm sorry, I'm messing this up because my cat really, really, really wants to be in the shot for a moment. Okay, apologies, this Easter egg. Um, so you cannot derive <laughs> normative statements from positive statements. So normative cannot be derived from positive or normative or if you want prescriptive statements. Uh, cannot be derived from positive statements. So normative statements can only be derived from other normative statements. Mm -hmm. So prescriptive or, and, and positive would be descriptive in this sense. And this was an important thought when I, again, most of my students are uh, uh, second and third year students. So when I was, when I was myself a second year student, I actually took this course that I'm teaching right now, philosophy of science. And uh, 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 a teacher, a seminar teacher, told me, mm -mm, gave this example. They said, Ima it's like, imagine something like um, a normal kind of automatic judgment that we have. Pain. Pain is bad. Uh, inflicting unnecessary suffering is, is bad, right? Is that true? Is that true? And they gave the following example. Imagine you have a, a, ro a cockroach, right, in your, in your house, like an insect and you just squash it uh, maybe you squash it for fun although that sounds a bit cruel or maybe you squash it because you are disgusted by it or you're afraid that it's carrying disease right and you want to you want to make your house more hygienic right you, you get rid of the roach is that an evil action right and it's like you know the roach maybe is suffering maybe the roach had expectations, had ch children, <laughs> something like that, right? And you have just ended a life. Is that, is that evil? Is that evil? You see? And the teacher pointed out, and Hume points out, that unless you attach an independent value to life, unless you postulate that there's value to life, you cannot say that squashing a roach is a bad thing. David Hume himself gives the following example. So let me, uh, uh, let me note my example with a roach cockroach, right? And another example that uh, uh, Hume himself gives is he says, imagine you have an oak and there's an acorn, it falls below an oak, and then this small acorn blossoms into another oak tree. And this 
offspring oak overshadows the older oak, which, which, which is its parent, and destroys it. So this would be, I think the English word is parasite, parasite. So when a child murders their parent, right? Um, I think it's like this. So oak parasite, something like that. So this, this is an example by David Hume. Hume wants to say, you know, it's like, you could, you know, we, we are tempted to say, of course, a parasite is evil and horrible. Nobody should ever do that. But with the example with an oak, would you, would you really say it's, it's bad? Would you really say it's bad? So it's like, what I'm driving at is that values can really be only derived from other values. And the way we solve this problem is, is by acknowledging that human beings are born with values. So uh, are values subjective? Are values subjective or relative? And that's, that's a very good question. Uh, um, you know, like in some sense, I don't want to jump to conclusions. I don't want to say it's like a simple, meaningless question. But on the other hand, I feel it's also not like anything goes. Why? Because humans have a nature. Humans have a nature. And our nature is, is, do, is like a robust description of human nature. And our nature is dual. It's partly biological and it's partly social. Again, I keep talking about human beings as products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution, right? And kind of both of these play a role in, in what we are. And like not anything goes. So Hobbes says, Whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire is what man calls good. The object of your desire you call good, the object of your aversion you call evil. But it's not up to you to decide what you want and what you don't want. Desires are what you find yourselves with. This is why Heidegger is so important to me, because I want to say that there's a very important connection between Hobbes and Hume, uh, Hobbes or Hume, and Heidegger. Because Hobbes and Hume are going to acknowledge this before Heidegger, that we find ourselves with desires and we don't choose. Again, like, I want to have a drink of water. I don't choose to want to have a drink of water. It's something that happens to my body. I find myself with these desires. It's a naturalistic way. So I'm trying to do this. This is a broadly speaking utilitarian project. I mean, John Stuart Mill is a very important philosopher to me. In fact, I want to add this at some point because... I kind of want to keep this in mind. Uh, uh, Mill, Nietzsche, and Marx are two supremely important philosophers for my understanding of these topics. And I feel it's very important to read all three at the same time. Mill through the prism of Nietzsche, through the prism of Marx, M Marx in dialogue with one another. But, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get there. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I have a temptation to talk about everything at the same time. But let me go back one step and let me uh, uh, give you an example. You see, again, many, especially first-year students, well, first-year, second-year students, I don't want to be ageist or judgmental, but I feel it's a, it's a, it's a true statement. It's a, it's, a, it's a robust description. And it, it was true about me as well. We are tempted to say, well, but what is happiness? It's like, mm, mm. so let's, so human have a biological social, so, so we want to be happy. We want to be happy, right? This, 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 this would be the foundation of naturalist values. But is happiness subjective? Is happiness subjective or relative? And again, you see, when you're a first, second year student, you are tempted at this relatively uh, sort of mm, tempted, you know, this relativism, subjectivism, skepticism. Relativism, uh, subjectivism, skepticism, more importantly, solipsism. It's again this issue of solo ipso, only I exist, this extreme version of subjectivism. Could it be that only I exist in the entire world? And let me... Um, give the most forceful example I can give. Uh, it's pain and disease. Can you have a solipsist with an appendicitis? Solipsist with an appendicitis. Mm -hmm. You see where I'm driving at, right? So it's like the is ought problem, the is ought problem. Mm -hmm. Illustration. Uh, you should carry an umbrella. Why? Because it's raining outside. Why? Mm -hmm. 
Can you derive an ought, you should, carry an umbrella from an is, it's raining? No, no, no. You need to add a presupposition that you do not want to get wet. But that's the point. Human nature is such that most people under normal circumstances do not want to get wet. Mm -hmm. So if, if you tell me, uh, Alex, you should carry an umbrella, and I'm asking you why, and you tell me it's raining outside, that's a meaningful conversation. It stops there. That's a language game that we play. If I ask you then why, you would think there's something wrong with me or I'm being funny or I'm you know, joking around or something like that. Let me, let me give you a more uh, dramatic example. Again, I, I apologize. I don't want to get people upset, but still, like imagine you have a friend and they're calling you and they say that, uh, let's say their child or maybe their younger sibling is in deep pain. They have high, t you know, high fever, temperature, and, and, and pain. And, and they're asking you, like, what, what should I do? What should I do? Think about this. Again, human beings are biological and social. We have biological proclivities. Our biological proclivities are similar, you know, biological nature. And also, it's like, we're part of the same culture. We're part of the same language. Again, if you want to be, like, this extreme Cartesian solipsist or skeptic, you could say, what do you mean, what should you do? Like, like I'm calling you up and I'm, 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 you know, for some reason, like, you see me in the street or I don't know, you see me in a classroom and I'm, I'm telling you, I have a horrible splintering headache. What should I do about it? What would you recommend, right? And imagine you, you're being, you, you know, another person being clueless and asking, Alex, what do you mean? So, hmm, don't, haven't you read David Hume, Alex? Don't you know? that ought statements don't follow from is statements. The fact that you have a splintering headache does not mean that you should do anything in particular. You see? You see where I'm driving at? You see where I'm driving at? Mm -hmm. Examples of disease or pain, uh, uh, it's like immediately, it's obvious. It's obvious, right? You don't need a separate argument to establish that pain is bad. This is what Hobbes says. Whatever is the object of your desire, you call good. Whatever is the object of your aversion, like pain, you call evil. Pain is naturally evil. And notice, I don't need to have an argument for that. I have, you know, like I understand from within myself that pain is evil. So, and, and this, is, this, is an ex this is a discussion which I've had with students on so many occasions. This is such an important discussion for me. So I want to say this is imminent criterion, imminent criterion. As opposed, so imminent criterion of what? Imminent criterion of goodness uh, uh, or virtue or happiness or value, right? Something like that. Imminent criterion. When I say imminent, I mean um, imminent in Latin means, means present at hand. So it is something that exists within your mind if you want. So... Uh, 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 you can oppose, you can counterpose, contrast the imminent criterion of goodness. You can contrast it with certain versions of uh, uh, transcendent criteria or, you know, transcendent, transcendental, something like that. Well, I should say transcendent. Kant uses the word transcendental in a very special technical sense, so, you know, we should not abuse this word. So, so as opposed to, as opposed to transcendent criterion. Um, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting fact about human nature and about human societies, about human culture, human history, right? That human beings have linguisticality. Sprachlichkeit, Sprachlichkeit. We don't just exist, but we also describe our existence. So it is possible, and this is kind of, you understand, it's sort of all sorts of potential discussions we could have here, like Nietzsche talks about this, right? How um, you do something that feels good. But at the same time, you tell yourself, no, that's shameful. I should not be doing that. That's shameful or sinful. I should not be doing that. This is transcend transcendent criterion at work, right? So somebody is living their life to the fullest. They feel this affirmation of life, this Nietzschean amor fati, right? They're, they're happy. They feel sort of, you know, joy and power and strength and health emanating through, through their whole existence. And somebody comes and says to them, you are sinful. The, the, the laughing, you know, if you are full, if you are laughing, Jesus says at one point, woe to you, you will be cursed. 
the first shall become last, the last shall, be, shall become first. If you are happy, if you are healthy, you should be sorry. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So this is transcendent criterion. This is a transcendent criterion of, of goodness or something, right? So transcendent in the sense that it goes beyond. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so again, ima so imminent criterion, let me, let me give you examples of imminent criterion. Uh, uh, moral philosophies, which are imminent moral philosophies. One example definitely would be Buddhism. Like, again, I have to remind, keep reminding myself and you that philosophy is a battleground. We have these age-old battles raging on. And uh, um, actually, I should have begun with this. Sorry, I meant to, but I forgot completely. <laughs> uh, 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 again, I feel it's like very often, not always, but very often, uh, uh, courses in philosophy, especially in history of philosophy, are taught from a particular perspective from a Christian or post-Christian or maybe some other religious perspective. And, you know, we theme, you know, this particular philosophers are thematized, particular approaches are thematized. And it's, it's important, right? Uh, a choice of topics and choice of issues is, is, is value-laden. Like, which philosophers you choose to discuss has an impact. And so I have just recorded a course, which and not, right now it's an, in, it's an open beta. So if you want to hear me talk about all this stuff much more, in 16 lectures, to be precise, I have recorded a course for Coursera over the summer, uh, uh, Introduction to Political Philosophy. It's more like Introduction to Moral, Social, and Political Philosophy, or, or, or like it's Introduction to History of Western Philosophy with a Moral, Social, and Political emphasis, right? And it's already all, it's available on Coursera. It's an open in open beta, if you want. Like, it's it's not entirely complete, but it's, in, you know, it's, a, it's already available if you want to listen to it. Um, it's going to launch properly on the 1st of November, but it's already right now. So, so you, you can see my attempt at giving a different kind, alternative history of philosophy. And I, I feel that that's a, very, that's a very important task that I have on myself, right? But let me go back a step. So, so in philosophies such as Buddhism, certain versions of Buddhism, certain strands of Buddhism, but also Epicu Epicureanism. But also, I want to say Hobbes, definitely uh, John Stuart Mill. Right? Mills utilitarianism. And I would consider myself, broadly speaking, as a utilitarian. And again, it's like, I have this, you know, it's like, can I do this? So Nietzsche, Nietzsche, in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Zarathustra says, right? Was liegt am meinem Glücke? Es ist Armut und Schmutzt und ein erbärmliches Behagen. Aber uh, meine Glücke sollte das Dasein selbst rechtfertigen. Apologies, right? So, what is my happiness? What matters my happiness? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment, says Zarathustra. My happiness does not matter at all. We don't have capital V values. So, in this imminent criterion, this is a deflationary project. This is not capital V values. This is small v values uh, uh, in a sense that it's, it's just my happiness. It's merely my happiness. It's merely my, you know, my pleasure, if you want. And it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. This is what Zarathustra says. But, and here's the but, my happiness ought to justify existence itself. Das Dasein selbst rechtfertigen, right? My happiness ought to justify existence itself. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Be why? Because it can? No, but because nothing else will. Is it a sufficient justification? No, my happiness is not a justifi sufficient justification. But nothing else can justify existence. Nothing else can be used to derive values. This is like God is dead, and so, you know, there's no access to truth with capital T. There's no, no access to values with capital V. So we have small t truth as this collective uh, um, project of public dialogue and small v values again, which we establish through this collective project uh, uh, of public dialogue, right? Because I want to be happy, you want to be happy, and we have a robust common nature. It's like, again, I hate headaches, and you hate headaches, right? It's like, somebody gets a COVID, you say, oh, I'm sorry. You don't expect this, you don't expect, you say, like, why are you sorry? I'm so happy I got COVID. It's like, nobody says that, right? It's, 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 it's just, 
uh, and and to and to say that you know happiness is subjective or relative is just I think that's disingenuous. That's not the way we live our lives. This is why Heidegger is important. Again, it's like we are born into a certain situation, certain particular position. It's like and beliefs, values, and desires which we have no chosen. We 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 are. This is a part of the human condition, right? Um, so I want to say that uh, you know. First, second, third year students are tempted to subjectivism and solipsism. But if you think about this for a little bit, you know, it's like this, this, is, this is not a very serious philosophical proposition. This is not a way we live our lives. Notice, this is a pragmatic argument. It's, it's not a knockdown, epidictic, geometric demonstration, right? It is, it is more like, like a pragmatic, um, how should I put this, like performative argument. It's like, Yes, you can be skeptic all you want, but then you go and take a COVID shot. You see, you see what I'm driving at. It's like, you know, you can be a skeptic all you want, but then you want to take a glass of water and your desire to take a glass of water, to take a sip, takes over. Your body takes over. You're not in control, ultimately. Mm. So, okay, to not leave this hanging. So, so I'm doing battle. So, so Buddhism, Epicureanism, Hobbes, Mill, I'm doing battle against, for example, divine theory versus divine theory, divine command theory, which would presumably say, it's like, this is a very dramatic example that's very often given, especially in the context of uh, uh, Euthyphro, Euthyphro. Um, this is a, a wonderful dialogue by Plato, by Plato. Euthyphro, I think it's like this. No. No. Uh, my <laughs> Sorry, word doesn't know this. Uh, phrase Euthyphro. Yes, I think it's right. Um, so, so Euthyphro is a is a very interesting dialogue by Plato when they discuss a uh, 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 command theory of morality. And Socrates. So Euthyphro is this self appointed prophet from the uh, ancient Athenian gods, and um, Socrates is is kind of being incredulous. And and Socrates says, well. Is it, is it that gods define what is good, or is there an objective standard of goodness that exists before the gods, above the gods, more important than the gods? This is the Euthyphro problem. And it's very often it's phrased in terms of the binding of Isaac from the Hebrew Bible, right? If God tells you to kill your child and burn their remains as an offering to them, would you do it just because God commands you? Or do you think that there's a like a, a deeper standard of morality embedded in the universe? Right? Kind of all sorts of discussions we could have about this. I don't know if I should mention this or not, but it's kind of it's interesting, right? So we talk about teleological mechanistic worldview. One of very important uh, um, um, Jewish theologians of the 20th century, Yehiskel Kaufman, Yehiskel Kaufman, uh, uh, talks about this transition in the Hebrew Bible from this um, like amoral, non-moral. Um, um, view of the gods, uh, kind of, we have like like abstract powers, ma magic. You can do certain things to to make like non moral reading of the gods, and then you have this moral view in the Bible. This also has connotations with uh, uh, Karl Jaspers. I'm trying to talk about everything at the same time. Kind of, this is so. Uh, this is topics for future discussions. So Hiskel Kaufman. Uh, and Carl Jaspers, right? So they would talk about this. Wow, sorry. Uh, uh, they would talk about this transition again. Jaspers very famously talks about axial age, um, transition to this moral outlook. So something like mm, non-moral, non-moral theology. Where, where, again, you have this council of gods, and gods are immoral, and you have these, like, power relations, and, and you can have things such as magic and coerce gods, and there is no strict separation between gods and mortals, versus, again, this deeply moral outlook, moral universe. And you understand, right? So I'm fighting against that to some extent. I, I, I want, it's like, very famously, uh, Machiavelli or Rousseau thought that uh, pagan, um, uh, virtue, pagan morality, was supreme to Christian morality. Machiavelli and Rousseau very famously thought that, uh, again, that um, for political reasons, politically, pagan religion, pagan religion and uh, ethics, morality, 
was superior was superior to Christian morality. And 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 they, you know, in anticipate well, Machiavelli, Rousseau, and of course you could also add Nietzsche, right? Actually, to some extent, um, Mill talks about something like this. He talks about pagan self-assertion and Christian self-denial. Pagan self-assertion and Christian self-denial, right? Um, again, this idea that Christianity is life-denying, whereas pagan religion was life-affirming. Um, so, so again, again, I want to oppose this. So, I want to say, I want to question uh, uh, Jaspers' judgment. Maybe it's not the case that, well, I mean, it's like all sorts of reasons to doubt this idea of the axial age and emergence of the, of the unified morality, partly because I feel because he lumps everything together. He thinks that Confucius is the same as Plato, is the same as Jesus. And, you know, I don't think that's true. I do not think that's true at all. So I, I would disagree with Jaspers on so many levels. But also, I don't think that there's necessarily any progress in that, right? And in fact, again, I feel that maybe certain... I don't, I'm not saying that we should go to pagan morality, but I feel that there's definitely an interesting, maybe, discussion to be had. Uh, you know, within this new naturalist scientific worldview. Like, if you, look, if you look at this picture, if you look at this picture, maybe there's something to be learned from pagan morality, from pre-Christian uh, ancient Greek and Roman morality, as opposed to, uh, you know, later Abrahamic traditions. Partly because, again, I, th- I feel for the ancient Greeks, I feel for Socrates. He, you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, assume that, you know, the, the goal in life is uh, um, excellence, which, you know, arete, which, like, if you are an excellent individual, you, you will be happy. Like, like, these two things are two parts of the same coin, two parts of the same coin. So, let, let me maybe add this here. So, uh, uh, virtue, in Greek, the word is arete, uh, um, not Christian virtue, but pagan virtue, is the same thing as uh, um, eudaimonia, happiness. In fact, you know, Socrates is no, uh, uh, notoriously going to say that virtue is knowledge, is happiness. Uh, virtue, uh, um, you know, leads to happiness is, and is attained through knowledge. Okay, okay, okay. So, 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 like, what I'm driving at is that it's very important, right? So, if the universe is the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, Somebody like Kant would say morality is impossible. If there's no free will, morality is impossible, says Kant, right? And I want to say we're going to have a new morality. It's like with, with Nietzsche, with Marx, with Mill, with Freud, we're going to have a new morality. So Kant says no free will. Morality means morality is impossible. And Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx are going to say, no, we're going to have a new morality. Which is based on affirmation of life. And again, how do you know what is objectively good? Well, not suffering is, you know, it's like, objectively is a complicated story because I, I think that morality is not objective, is not exactly objective, is not quite objective. It is socially constructed. Uh, socially constructed uh, 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 through public dialogue. But there is this space for consensus, broad consensus. And Mill likes to use this phrase. He says, if everyone or almost everyone agrees. So uh, so Mill is going to say everyone or almost everyone agrees. And an example, everyone or almost everyone agrees that it's good to be over with COVID pandemic. Let's fight against COVID. Right? It's like this this would be this would be for me an example of a robust, not exactly objective, but like socially constructed value, but it's not arbitrary. It's not anything goes, right? Even if it's even though it's socially constructed, it's not like anything goes. There are constraints, biological and cultural constraints. Okay, again, like, hmm, Hegel. Hegel has to be somewhere here. I, I love Hegel. And my reading of Hegel is secular, left Hegelian. Like, I'm a left Hegelian, if you want. Secular, left Hegelian reading of Hegel. Uh, uh, and, and Hegel would alert our attention to the fact that, again, 
It's not that anything goes. Human beings are products of culture, and culture develops historically. Anti-Kantian, anti-Lockean project. A criticism of a certain kind of liberalism. Because I want to say that Hegel is also a liberal. He's a communitarian liberal. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, uh, let me also... I think I feel that maybe I should be wrapping this up, but let me also add a certain wrinkle. So, does it mean that it's easy? Is it easy? So, I told you about this imminent criterion. Is it easy to know what is good? No. What makes us happy? And I want to say not necessarily. Not necessarily. But it's like I always like medical analogies. Is it easy to be healthy? No, not necessarily, but, but, but we strive and we more or less know what makes us healthier. It's like, and again, I also gave this example, like, again, imagine you have a spouse, a partner, or imagine you have a child or a relative, and you want to make them happy or happier. You know what makes people happy. Like, uh, uh, tasty, healthy food, you know, brew them a cup of, uh, you know, herbal, you know, tasty herbal tea, or something like that, or, 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 or like, take them to a nice movie or a musical concert, right? So there's like a robust nature of human being, like a thick description of what human beings are. Human beings have a nature. It's like, it's distasteful to talk in our multicultural times about human nature, but it's true. Nobody wants to get COVID, and it's like there's a space for broad consensus about what is good music and what is bad music, right? What, what, the kind of music that elevates you, makes your mind expand, makes you, you know, uh, uh, makes you, I don't know, happier, more, uh, more, alert, self-conscious, and, 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 and trash music, which is, you know, just, you know, I don't know. Well, you understand what I'm, what I'm driving at. But I feel that there's, again, this space for broad consensus, because, again, again it's like music has impact on, you, on your body. It's like you, you eat a chocolate bar, and you feel, and you feel bad, and, and it's bad for your health, and, you know, you have this sugar rush. But at the same time, there's other food, which is good. It's like medicine, and, you know, it, it, makes, it makes you calm. It's like, this is why meditation is so important. This is why things like yoga are so important. Because, again, this, this stupid commercial music that, that is, uh, uh, you know, just supposed to abuse your dopamine systems in your brain, and it's like, it's like chewing gum, and it's, you know, it's, it's fun to listen to for one moment, and then it sticks in your head, whatever. But then there's other kinds of music, uh, and different people like different music, but it's like, it, it does something to you, like it, it expands your consciousness, expands your mind, makes your life richer. And, and there's, there's a difference between the two. And this difference is, to some extent, I don't want to say it's, it's completely objective, but it's, it's not, maybe it's socially constructed, but it's not arbitrary. But anyway, so what I'm driving at, it's not necessarily, so to, to some extent, it's easy to know what makes us happy. Like, uh, uh, um, Especially in the negative, like we know that we do not, we don't want to suffer. Like, like torture is bad. Uh, 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 torture, pain, uh, you know, <laughs> misery, hunger. Like all these things are bad. So, so it's so it's easy to know what what makes us less unhappy, right? But also there are harder things to know. And John Stuart Mill, and again, again, I, I, I remind you, Nietzsche with Mill and Marx. Nietzsche with Mill and Marx in conversation. Mill talks about these higher versus lower pleasures. And, you know, Mill will, will insist that you need, a, you know, if you really, really, really want to become happy, and if we as humanity want to progress towards greater and greater happiness, we need experiments in living. Experiments in living. And it's possible that we can discover different ways of being happier, more ways of being happier. Let me just give you one strange example. Uh, floating. <laughs> Uh, this is something that people do. You have this uh, 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 sensory deprivation chamber. Sensory deprivation chamber. This is this is a kind of meditation that people do these days. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a tank full of um, solution of very salty solution, and you submerge yourself in this tank, and it's dark, and it's quiet, and uh, um, the chamber also absorbs sound. And so you can get into this state of very deep, very calm meditation. So what I'm driving at is that this is a kind of experience that was by and large unavailable. Like Descartes could not quite do this. Socrates could not quite do this. But today in the 21st century, we have invented new ways of, you know, deriving pleasure from existence. And, you know, I want to say that, you know, floating 
although in my crazy schedule, I don't really have a lot of time to do to engage in it. But when I can make time in, in, in my schedule to engage in floating, this is one of the best moments in my life. It's, it's beautiful. It's this very calm meditative pleasure. It's sublime. If you've never tried it, I highly recommend, although you do need some preparation. It's difficult to do. It's a moment. Thank you, Nikolai, for reminding me. It's a very important moment of mindfulness. Let's, I, I want to I wanna do this maybe every class and every video. A moment just to be mindful. Take a deep breath in and out. I actually have a larger singing bowl. Maybe we could do something, something with that. You know, it's like, you know, being calm, you know, meditation. It's, it's, and notice, notice, Buddha talks about this. Uh, how do we know what makes us happy? Buddha says, the first truth of existence is dukkha, dukkha, suffering. We all suffer. Existence is suffering. And we all want not to suffer. So in this sense, we have a common nature, common human nature. And it entails common human experience of suffering and a common human desire to get rid of suffering. And again, it's like, let me, I feel like wrapping this up. But let me again reaffirm my allegiance this year kind of this pro to this productive dialogue, the three names, my three names for this year, the three guiding names are uh, Buddha, Marx, and Foucault. <laughs> uh, this entails also talking about so many other people <laughs> in this course. But, but th these, these are the three names, the three champions of naturalist morality that, that I want to be in dialogue with constantly throughout this year. Okay, I feel, I'm sure there's a million other things I'm forgetting, but I hope... This gives you at least some way of thinking of what it means to relate to yourself existentially, relate to others ethically, and to relate to humanity politically, if this picture is true. If this picture is true, there's some space for morality. As an asterisk, because I have OCD, I remind you this is Lagrangian of the standard model of particle physics. It's incomplete. It doesn't include gravity. So it's an, it's an incomplete formula. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, let me check if somebody's saying something in the stream, and we'll wrap this up in a moment. Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer. Uh, uh, so, call me Shibboleth, again, drops by. Thank you, thank you, colleagues, again. Uh, 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 these little interactions, especially at the end of streams, mean a lot to me. Um, Schopenhauer is a philosopher I've been interested in for f forever. And basically, I have a deep interest in Buddhism, and I also have a deep interest in Nietzsche. <laughs> and so I feel Schopenhauer kind of relates to both. I'm not really an expert on Schopenhauer, but I, I, I'd really love to learn more. By the way, students, students who are thinking of presentation topics, Schopenhauer, interesting presentation topic, I'm going to learn from you. you ha hopefully you learn from me, I'll learn from you, at least to some extent. Yeah. So call me Shibboleth asks some interesting questions uh, or, or makes some interesting, insightful comments. I need, I need to th th some time to think and respond. But, you know, again, I deeply appreciate all, all these comments. Uh, 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 Nikolai um, was calling me out on, on, on some things, especially when I was talking about bets, betting on uh, teleological versus mechanistic picture. And I want to do a proper response to this. But to some extent, I want to say, yes, there is a sense in which you can bet on naturalism versus teleology. Like, if I really believed in a teleological worldview, I would imagine that my choices in life might have been very different. So my, my naturalism, my uh, uh, tentative belief, again, skeptic first, naturalist second, skeptic and fallibilist first, my tentative fallibilist belief that this picture is actually true is what informs my decisions. Whether I should get COVID shot, whether I should get pets, whether I should get married or have children, or how should I bring my children up. So I, I feel there's a deep connection there. But this is not a full-fledged response. I, I need to think about this some more. Anyway, anyway, colleagues, I, I, tried, I tried to read... Uh, I tried to... Uh, uh, I, 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 sort of, I wanted to get these 
ideas out because following up from some things that we talked about in the seminar yesterday. Um, so anyway, I hope this was fun and stimulating. Uh, everybody, let's keep the dialogue alive. I'm looking forward to your comments, questions, and even more, maybe more importantly, objections. And until next time, stay safe and take care.